Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm now here not to talk about EuroPython, <clears throat> but instead to talk about Python. So a bit of speaker introduction. Uh, I've been around for ages. Uh, I don't really want to you know, tell you how long I've been using Python. Um, I've been very active in the, in the community. I've been EuroPython Society a chair and fellow and um, PSF founding fellow and Python core developer, Unicode, for example, or the DB API, that's all on me. Um, and there are lots of other stuff that you can read on the website there. What I want to talk about is a use case that we, um, in my company, Genix, we ran into in 2008. So we had developed a, a product which consisted of a, um, a client application that you could basically download as a package from PyPI and a server application that you had to install on the server providing database connectivity. <clears throat> it was called uh, MXODBC Connect Server and we allowed this to work on uh, Windows and on Unix. And for Windows, we had a good solution for that for the server side, so we just used Py2Exe at the time but for, for Linux, we didn't, or for Unix in general, we didn't find anything that was suited for this. Now, of course, we could have just said, okay, please install Python on the Unix server, and then you install our package, and it should work. But the realities on, on Linux are typically different, and on other uh, Unix derivatives uh, as well, because every single vendor basically customizes the Python installation in one way or another, and so supporting all this as a small company is next to impossible. So we wanted to make sure that the Python installation being used on the server side was basically managed by us. And so we wanted to ship Python, the complete Python installation, along with the product. So <clears throat> these are the, or were the business requirements that we had back in 2008. Uh, everything should have should be you know completely independent of the OS Python installation. Uh, we wanted it to make it very easy to distribute, very easy to to put on the server. We wanted to support mostly Linux, but also other app platforms like Mac OS, FreeBSD, and in those days, I think we also supported Solaris. Um, and so we thought. How can we do this? Because we didn't want to ship 100 megabytes worth of uh, files to the, to the client. So I remembered um, an even older project from 1998 um, that I had started, which is called uh, MX CGI Python. How many of you know what CGI actually is? Not many anymore. So that was basically the way to do dynamic websites in those days. So uh, in, in case you wanted to, to put some, you know, let's say a web shop or so on, on, the webs, uh, on, the, on the internet, then you had to basically rent some space at a web hoster, <clears throat> uh, put your code there, and, and then hopefully it, it ran. The only way to, to do this was to upload files into a CGI bin directory on an FTP site that you had. And of course, in those days, Python was not as popular as it is nowadays, so pretty much all the web servers that you could rent only supported Perl and maybe shell scripts. So what we did is we uh, wanted to put Python there and we had kind of like a similar situation. We wanted to make it easy to ship the Python to that web hoster. Um, and so what we did is we basically thought it would be a good idea to wrap Python up into a single file, just upload it, use a shell script to make it executable and I put it into the CG, CGI bin directory to have Python as a runtime. And this actually worked. So we kind of hacked ourselves into the web hosters. And lots of other people thought it was a great idea, and so we got lots and lots of help and support for various different platforms, <clears throat> all kinds of different Unix systems. And we supported um, all the, the popular Python versions at the time. Of course, after a certain while, the web hosters started to realize that Python is actually a thing, and so they started supporting it as well. And we basically did not have to support MXCGI Python anymore. But this turned out to be an excellent recipe for, for our problem that we had in 2008. So how does this work? Or what's, the, what's the, the recipe, the secret sauce behind all this? So if you want to try to put everything into a single file, you have to do multiple things. One is that you have to take the interpreter, which you normally get as a binary, 
you have to add all the C extensions that come with the standard library and link those statically into that binary so that you have those available. And then you need to find out a way of how to get the Python code into that binary as well. And the way that uh, we did this is we, we used a tool for this to basically compile all the Python files into bytecode and then put the bytecode into C arrays, compile them, and then link them statically into that binary. So the end result is a single binary that includes the, the Python code of the standard library plus all the C extensions. And the tool we used for that is called Freeze. That is actually a tool that Guido himself wrote in 1994. So it's, it's really, really old. Uh, it still exists in the source distribution of Python. I don't think many people actually know about it. It's, it's gotten some recent use uh, for the import lib uh, that we have in, in, in CPython because the import mechanism in CPython was rewritten from C in Python and then uh, this freeze tool was used to then basically do the same thing, freeze the bytecode and then put it into the binary. So this is a great tool. It worked great on, on Linux. It, Mark Hammond also made it work on Windows, but we didn't want to uh, use it on Windows. So we had a solution for our problem. So we used this MXCGI Python and, and then basically shipped our product uh, with this technology. Then, of course, because we saw that it's actually quite a successful way of, of distributing software, we thought we might be able to take this a little further. So we wanted to have a command line available for this, for this binary. Now, the, the thing is that if you freeze something and you compile it, you don't have a, a command line interface available that you can use. So we had to basically re-implement the Python command line interface in Python and then again freeze it into the binary and make it work like that. It's a little bit slower, but it's a whole lot easier to maintain that the, than the uh, C version that you have in CPython. And then over time, of course, we also wanted to have interactive um, use available, so the REPL. Uh, we added zip file support uh, for the whole thing. We added support for PIP and setup tools and all the other nice uh, things that you have in the packaging space. We even made it possible to compile C extensions using that single binary. Of course, you needed the include files, so we had to ship those uh, for, for those cases where we wanted uh, C, comp C compilation to actually work. But then you can just use, for example, pip and have pip compile things on the fly for you when installing stuff. And then in 2012, at EuroPython, of course, we uh, open sourced everything as Egenix PyRun. So where are we today with Eugenics PyRun? It's today, it's open source uh, license, it's Apache license. Uh, it's, it's free, of course, like uh, most of the Apache software. It's an almost uh, complete you know, drop-in replacement for the Python runtime. It's available for Python 3.8 up until 3.11. Uh, and I'm gonna try to work on the port to 3.12 at the sprints. So if someone wants to help or maybe dive into this, then uh, please you know, come join me. The executable sizes are pretty small, actually. So you have a complete runtime in between four or six megabytes on disk. And it works on Linux and uh, also on, on Windows if you use WSL. It used to also work on, on Mac OS and FreeBSD and some other Unix systems, but we haven't looked into uh, those ports for the more recent versions anymore because we simply didn't have a use case for that. Um, it doesn't support native Windows, but we could probably make it work as well. And we've actually had lots of requests for this, especially from teachers and other people, uh, you know, trying to show to, to pupils or to students how Python works and make it easy to install. It includes most of the Python standard library. Of course, we stripped out a few things that we don't need for, for shipping products, like, for example, the test suites or a couple of, of uh, you know, lesser used modules. Um, and it does support all the Python C extensions that you have. So you can, you can have NumPy run, you can have Pandas, you can have Polars, um, all the, the packaging stuff works. So it's pretty complete. And this is the, how it looks like when you open the shell and look at the file sizes. You see this PyRun 3.11 there. That's a compressed version. It uses UPX, 
the compressor for uh, basically stripping down the um, the file and, and compressing it into an executable that decompresses on invocation. Um, the standard one that you see there, the 19 megabytes, that is uncompressed. And depending on use case, let's say if you want really fast startup times, then you should probably use the standard one because the UPX one uh, does take a bit longer to start up because of the decompression that's needed. And then, of course, we also ship the debug version, which has all the debug symbols the, the, from the uh, C compiler included in case you need that. And you run it just like standard Python. And then you get a prompt. You can do stuff in the REPL. So I mentioned what's, what's in the box. I mentioned that it, most of the Python standard library is in there. And I decided to basically also disclose what's not included, of course, because you know, out of fairness. Um, like I said, the test modules are not included. Uh, some other modules that we don't need are, are not included, like intro pip, for example. You can install that if needed um, um, you know, using getpip.py, for example. Uh, TK intro we don't have in there. Turtle we don't have in there. Parser, tab nanny. Um, we remove this utils because it's, it's been deprecated anyway and it's going to be removed in, I think, 3.13. And some of the other modules that are currently uh, deprecated in 3.11 already, because we don't need them, and um, I don't think that many people are using them anymore. There are also a couple of modules that we don't link statically, again, simply because we didn't need them. Uh, one is the uh, Dunder decimal module. Some of you may, may think, well, why, why not decimal? Well, we're not using decimal, and, and the decimal module is actually you know, quite a huge chunk of, of code. Um, C types is not included because we, again, we don't need it. Read line is not included because of licensing issues. Um, and you know, the other things, they all work if you install the uh, .so files and everything can be configured. So if you need these things, it's well possible to, to put them into the binary as well. Right, so where are we now in 2024? Of course, we want things to work a bit differently than in 2008. We want to make it possible to, to actually use PyRun to, to ship PyRun applications, which basically means a single binary that has the Py, PyRun runtime plus your application. And we might want to make all of that as, as simple as possible. So that's what we're currently working on. And then, once you have all that, you have some great use cases for EJX PyRun. A great use case, for example, is putting it into a Docker image. Because it's so small, if you, if you think about it, if you combine, combine this with um, the Alpine images, then you get really, really small uh, image containers that you can use to, to fire up a Python runtime in your Docker installation or Kubernetes. Um, something else that we thought about was having a truly OS-independent virtual environment replacement. So what you can do, or what, what we want you to be able to do uh, rather soon, is to just take a complete virtual environment and put that, let, it, let the, the, uh, the tool compile everything into this you know, single file or maybe just a small set of files. Like I said, training and education is a great use case because you want to make it very easy for people to just get up and running. And same for demos. Plus, there are probably lots more use cases that we haven't even thought about yet. So where do we want to go from here? We want to basically uh, create a small community around it, because it's been op open source since, 12, uh, since 2012. Uh, but we did not have it on GitHub yet, the reason being that we use a monorepo in Adigenix, and so it was not that easy to, to just you know, put everything up online. What we've done now is we have extracted everything from, from our mono repo, put it on GitHub on July 1st uh, as version 2.5.0, and we're basically continuing development there. So if you want to help, feel free to just go to the GitHub, GitHub uh, search for Egenix PyRun, and then you can, you can start you know, submitting pull requests or, or file issues there. Now some advanced topics, because I was uh, saying that we want you to be able to run Python applications with this. Um, the way to do that is very easy. If you have a, a Python application that is pure Python, it's literally just creating a zip file with your Python code, and then using the unix cat command 
to combine the Pyron binary and your zip file into a new file. And then make it executable and run it. And that's it. That's your application. Uh, so it's really, really easy. And you can even skip most of these steps by using the zip app module that you have in the standard uh, library. No compilation is needed. This is it. It's simply concatenating two files. The other thing, like I said, is if you want to customize PyRun. So, for example, you want to include extra libraries or extra C extensions that we don't have in the standard set. It's also very easy to do that. You, you don't need to be a core dev to do this. You do have to have some knowledge about how Python is being compiled, though. So you need to know how the freeze tool works, how it finds modules, how it puts everything into the um, binary. And you need to know how to configure modules in CPython. And because all of this is still too complex, we just said that we're just going to skip all this and we're going to create a command line tool for you to use. So basically, you can just enter the commands and then you know, use a few options. And the command line tool will basically take care of everything. So it'll provide ways of installing PyRun, updating it, building it. Uh, we want to make it very easy to just create these PyRun apps. And we want to make it very easy to create these PyRun virtual ends. This is work in progress. It's not been released yet, so we're still working on it. Um, of course, with every single Python version that uh, gets released, we have some extra work to do, right? Because we need to port it to those new versions. And sometimes things are easy. Not many things change in, in areas where we have to actually go in and then uh, make changes to C Python. At other times, uh, it's actually a lot of work. So 3.11, for example, was way more work and way more complex than anything else we did before. Uh, that was because uh, a lot of things in the, in the startup and a lot of things in the internals of CPython changed in those areas that we used. And so we, we had to basically put a lot of effort into making it work. And uh, you can also see that the Pyron size changed a lot between 3.10 and 3.11. And this is mostly because the bytecode uh, in CPython has become rather, well, verbose, let's say. Um, it's actually grown by about 40% between those two versions. Now, the good thing, though, is that, um, you know, you invest a little bit more space on your disk, and then you get a much faster uh, CPython. And that's basically on Mark and his team. So... Another nice thing is that this is mostly on us because, of course, we have the skills to do this, so you don't have to worry about it. Now, what we'd like maybe you to contribute to all of these things is um, some help in certain areas where we don't have the necessary deep skills or maybe uh, we don't have the necessary you know, platforms or infrastructure. So we would like some help with building and testing, which is, should be fairly easy. Um, if you have domain expertise, like say on, on Mac OS or especially on Windows, then we would definitely like to tap into that. So please come and talk to me if you uh, have skills in that area. We also want to explore cross-compiling to make it possible to compile, for example, on Linux and then uh, have everything run on Windows. There's a great uh, tool called ZixCC we want to explore for this. And of course, if you know about new use cases that we haven't thought about, we'd like to know as well. So you're welcome to, to contribute, and uh, we, we hope you like the tool. We hope you like the community that we're going to build around this. And yeah, this is like the main takeaway from all of this. You know, never, never forget about the stuff that you've done in the past. Uh, always keep remembering the tools that you might have in your, in your cupboard, and then try out new things. Uh, never stop to learn. And, um, Right, this is it. This is the, um, the resource page. I put all the links up here. The QR code goes straight to GitHub. And I have a few minutes left, so maybe I can show something. Can you see that? Yes. Problem is I can't see it. Um, right, what you have here, this is, a, um, this is basically the, the build directory where you where you build uh, PyRun. <clears throat> and the way it looks on disk is, um, 
basically like a standard Python installation. So you have a bin and include and lib directory. The bin directory is pretty much what I just shown, except that this also has some other stuff in it because we're using this for testing. And as you can see, uh, pip is installed, uh, setup tools is installed. A couple of other packages are installed because the, uh, we're using these for testing. Um, all of this works just fine. You have the include files uh, available, so if you want to compile something, then you can just compile things. You don't need this for, for regular use of uh, PyRun. And as you can see here, these are, oh, this, is not, this is not good, let's do it like this maybe. Yeah, these are the SO files that we, we don't have directly in the binary, but you can, you can if you, you know, reconfigure the, uh, the setup files, you can put those in there as well. And as you can see, the, where's the decimal one? Decimal one is here. So it's 1.6 megabytes just for decimal. And if you don't use it, I mean, why put it in there, right? So, but like I said, all this is configurable. We're going to make it very easy to use. And then just to show you how easy it is to create these. Uh, let's do a clean here to create these Pyron apps. So in, in this example, I used an old script I had <coughs> called XRE which is essentially like in the command line interface to the um, re-module. So it's really old code. It's a huge, huge hack I did at the time. Yeah, from 1996, ported it to Python 3, of course. And it has you know, all this nice code. And if you want to use it, then, of course, ideally, you just want to call it, right? So if you want to turn this into one of these PyRun apps, this is what you have to do. And, and here I'm using the zip app module. So you just in, invoke PyRun over here, and uh, then you use the zip app to create a, a zip file, which you can see here, app.pyz. And then you can concatenate both together, and make, it, make it executable, and it then runs, right? So this is how it looks. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I don't know if there are any questions. Oh, we already have someone there. I first want to give you this. This is a little cookie of <laughs> gratitude for you. Thank you. Um, thank you. And then the first question, please. Yeah, thank you for the talk. It's a really interesting topic for me. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, since right now you don't support standalone binaries, could you go a bit more in detail about what the runtime dependencies are? Because I think as a bridge, it would be nice to have an image that has just those dependencies that you could copy into uh, from, the, from the, yeah. In terms of dependencies, you just have, you mean the, the binary dependencies, yeah? So essentially, I could build it with the like base Python image, and then do like a multi-stage build and copy it into a scratch image with nothing, and it would still run. Right. You you basically just need um, you need a few libraries, of course, that you need to for compiling the modules in the standard library. Um, so like you know, bzip bzip2, for example, or OpenSSL, you need those things, um, and. Then once you have those, uh, you can basically compile everything. And then the resulting dependencies that you have on the binaries, they are pretty standard. So they look like this. Actually, I have to use the, um, not this one. I think this doesn't work, no. I have to go back to the build one. Because UPX basically removes all the symbols, so uh, LDD doesn't work on it. But if I go here, and then here, where is it? Nope, this is not it. Sorry. Where is it? Pyron, there you go. And then standard. 
These are the dependencies that you have on the binary. So pretty standard stuff. You have libc, you have the BZ, bz2, you have um, SQLite, of course, uh, OpenSSL, and the rest is just standard Python, uh, standard CLIP. Okay, thank you. Okay. Another question from the, from the other microphone. Hello. So uh, what if your application is a Jupyter notebook that runs with custom code? Is it possible to package it as well? Um, you would probably have to first turn the Jupyter notebook into a Python library, and I think there's a tool for that. I'm not very much into the data science stack, so I don't really know what it's called. But uh, once you have that tool, then yes, you can definitely take that and then compile everything into a single um, binary. Another question over here. Thank you. Amazing talk. Uh, your solution, Pyron, uh, seems similar like uh, Beware uh, package. Uh, I know about advantages, disadvantages, from if I compare Pyron and Beware? Right. Um, I don't have experience with that particular tool, but I, I do know other tools that uh, you know, use a similar approach. They try to basically pack everything into a single file. Most of those tools, though, they, they go and, and basically put everything, all your Python code, into a zip file. And then uh, this tool can actually go and then compile everything into, these, uh, into C and then uh, link it directly to your binary. The advantage with doing that versus um, having a zip file is that the OS can, can much more easily uh, access the code. So the startup time is much better. You don't have all this I.O. going on in order to load Python modules because it's already in RAM or memory mapped, right? Okay. Thank you very much. I don't think we have any more questions. So once again, give it up for Mark.